When we look out at the religious landscape today, we can see a whole multitude of organizations that claim Jesus Christ as their Savior, each one having its own unique beliefs on what one must do in order to become a Christian and the life of faith of God that he expects. The issue with this is that in the gospel there is only one institution which is referred to in English as the church. That being said, our purpose today, we're going to make a detailed examination of the one church we read of in the gospel, the good news of the new covenant. So stay tuned. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. The Bible is God's word to mankind. It is a combination of his directions for how we should live, a history of the world, a story with a purpose, and a revelation of God. The Bible is the ultimate authority on God in all matters of the Christian life and salvation. We hope you will study along with our speaker, Larry Fife, as Churches of Christ present Bible Talk. During Jesus' earthly ministry at a time when he was on the coast of ancient Caesarea Philippi, which today is Lebanon on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, he asked his traveling companions a question recorded for us in Matthew 16, 13. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? A number of his disciples gave various answers to this question, and then Simon Peter joins in and he nails it. In Matthew 16, 16 of this account, Peter is recorded as saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Greek word for Christ is pronounced Christos and means the anointed. Peter declared that Jesus was the anointed or chosen one, the Son of the living God. That's a pretty emphatic declaration and was obviously the answer that Jesus was looking for because in, verse Math, or in verses of Matthew 16, 17 through 19, we have recorded for us Jesus' approval of Peter's declaration. Notice this. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever thou shalt, or whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, within this account, there's a lot of information that we can use in order to help us lay the groundwork for properly understanding the gospel truth about the church Jesus promised to build. Again, Jesus said, I will build my church. Three points we need to observe which are significant to understanding the gospel truth about the church is that Jesus said, I will build. Jesus said he will build this church or his church. No near man or, or no mere man in in view here at all. The church that is being built is the product of divine construction through and through. John 1 1 reads that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 of the same context, we learn that the Word which was God and became flesh and dwelt among men on earth. Jesus Christ, who was also known as Emmanuel, was literally God with us. In Acts 20:28, 20, we read these words of Paul as recorded by Luke. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He, God, hath purchased with His own blood. We all know that Jesus was the one who shed His blood on the cross of Calvary. Paul said God purchased the church with His own blood. Jesus was truly Emmanuel, meaning that He was with us. The church Jesus said he was going to build was built and purchased by God, the Son of God, in the flesh. God said he was going to build his church. Again, no mere man can improve on what God has built. No near, n mere man can take away from it, and it would be the epitome of gross presumption to even think any mortal man would dare alter the design of church, of the church rather, that God built. Jesus then says, I will build my church. Ephesians 5.25 reads, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church that Jesus promised to build literally cost him his life. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, purchased the church he promised to build with his life. The purchase price for it was his lifeblood. It therefore indeed belongs to him. The church, the word church is an English word that was used to translate the Greek word 
ecclesia. This word carries two meanings depending on the context in which it's being used. And this is so important in our understanding of the church that we read about in the New Testament. The literal meaning of this word is the called. If we were to organize a birthday party and invite several of our friends to it, the people who show up of the party would be the ecclesia. An ecclesia is an assembly of people who were called together for a specific purpose. So this word is used also in the New Testament in reference to a mob of people who were upset because Paul preached against the pagan god Diana of the Ephesians. We can read this account, in fact, in Acts 19. And in Acts 19.32, we read, Some therefore cried one thing and, one, and some other, for the assembly, ecclesia, was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. The word assembly in this verse, in the original language, is ecclesia, which is the exact same word that Jesus used for church. This is by no means an isolated instance. The word ecclesia in the original language is found in Acts 19.39. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. Again, ecclesia. And then again in Acts 19.41, which reads, And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Again, ecclesia. This was a mob of people who were intent on killing someone over the preaching of the gospel. That wasn't a church as we know it by any means. The translators didn't translate this word as church in these instances because the context did not warrant it. It would have been an incorrect translation to refer to this ecclesia as a church. It wasn't a church, it was an assembly of angry people, so the translators used the word assembly instead of church. Other uses of the word ecclesia in the original language refer to individual assemblies of Christians in local areas. One example of this is found in Romans 16, 16, which reads, Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Paul referred to local assemblies when he addressed a letter to the churches of Galatia in Galatians 1, 2. John recorded Jesus addressing the churches of Asia in Revelation 1, 4. Paul similarly referenced the churches of Asia in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. All of these were assemblies of Christians. So we learn from this that a local assembly of Christians is referred to as ecclesia in the original language. The translators used the English word church when the assembly was in reference to Christians. The other use of this wor of word is used like the one we saw or read about in Matthew 16, 18 in our introductory text to represent the church or ecclesia that Jesus promised to build, which was the one universal worldwide assembly or collection of followers. When Jesus promised to build His church, He was saying He was going to build His assembly of followers. What we need to take from this is that never in the New Testament is the word ecclesia ever used for anything other than an assembly or group of people. It's never used in reference to a temple or a synagogue or any other place, physical building or structure of any kind. It is always used in reference to a collection of people assembled for a one or a specific purpose. Another thing to note in Matthew 16, 19 is what Jesus said in response to Peter's declaration of Jesus as the Son of the living God. It reads in Matthew 16, 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes a reference here to a kingdom. Jesus had just promised to build His assembly of followers, and now in the same breath, he tells Peter he's going to give him what he needs to unlock the doors or open the entrance to a kingdom, the entrance requirements. Obviously, there's a direct connection between the assembly of followers that Jesus promised to build and the kingdom that Jesus was going to open the entrance to. This is not the first time Jesus ever mentioned a kingdom, and it certainly is not the last. We don't have, a, we don't have near enough time to look at them all, but we're going to mention a few things that will possibly positively establish to us just what the connection is between the assembly of followers Jesus promised to build and the kingdom to which He was going to grant access. Notice what we find in Luke 17, 20-21. And when He was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus told them His kingdom was not something you could see coming. 
you can see an earthly kingdom such as the Roman Empire or the Israelite nation. You could see Rome and you could see Jerusalem, which was where these earthly kingdoms were ruled from. Jesus told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God was not like the earthly kingdom they were familiar with. The kingdom of God is something completely different. Then he went on to say this kingdom resided within you. This kingdom Jesus was preaching was not a physical kingdom with an earthly headquarters at all. With it residing within the hearts of people, it was spiritual in nature. Jesus promised to build His church, His one assembly of followers. The church was intended to be Jesus's, or Jesus Christ's assembly of saved souls from the beginning. This church was going to be a non-physical collection of followers who were called together. The assembly of followers Jesus promised to build in, th in this kingdom, rather, He said, we're going to grant access to. In other words, Jesus told Peter and the others in Matthew 16, 18, I'm going to build my assembly of believers and I'm going to give you the way to unlock or reveal the entrance to it for everyone. Both the church and the kingdom are non-physical assemblies or collections of people. So what we see from Matthew 16, 18 through 19 so far is that Jesus promised to build His assembly or calling of people it would be His assembly, and He only promised to build one. This assembly would be a kingdom of people, and the apostles were going to open the doors to it for everyone. We see now that the church and the kingdom are the same thing referred to by different terms. There are other terms used in Scripture in reference to this assembly or kingdom of Christ followers. So before we go into a few of those, let's consider that each one of these terms is used in a descriptive sense. These different terms are used to illustrate key aspects of, assembly, of, the, of this assembly of Christ and His followers in order to help us better understand its nature. This assembly of Christ's followers is a kingdom. Jesus is the king of His kingdom. In Ephesians 1, 20-23, we read, "...which He, meaning God, wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His right hand in heavenly places far above principality and power, and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, Jesus is the King reigning over His kingdom of heaven, and hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him, that filleth all in all. Here's another one of those words used in a, as a descriptive term for assembly of Christ's followers. The church is also the body of Christ. We see this repeated in, a five, in Ephesians 5.23 and then in Colossians 1.18, which reads, And He is the head of the body, the church, who was the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Jesus is in charge. He's the King over all things. The term ecclesia or church, as it is translated in English, is descriptive of a people who are called out. The term kingdom is descriptive of a realm or people with a king who rules over them. The term body is a descriptive of unity of the whole with different parts having different functions but all of the same entity. A body has fingers and toes, arms, legs, and so on. One body with many parts serving different functions for one complete purpose. A complete and functioning body also has a head which directs the toes, the arms, the legs, and so on. In Ephesians 1.22, Paul writes that Jesus is indeed the head over the body. He rules over it. He directs it, and the body obeys and follows His lead. Jesus, the King over His kingdom, and the head over His body. So we have two different descriptive terms in reference to the same thing. Paul described the concept and detail of the many functional parts of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 12-27. So I would encourage everyone to look that up and study that in its entirety. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 begins this wonderful illustration with, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Paul goes on to describe the different essential functions of the human body and comparing those with the various activities of those within the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 Paul concluded this illustration of the body of Christ with, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. 
In Colossians 2.17, Paul wrote, The body is of Christ. So the church of the gospel, the church Jesus promised to build in Matthew 16.18, is the kingdom of Christ, the body of Christ, and the called out assembly of Christians who follow Christ. It's not a physical thing like a building or, or something like that. It is a people who make up the spiritual realm and the spiritual body of followers of Christ. The church, the kingdom, and the body of Christ are the same thing and is populated by Christians. All Christians are in the church, the kingdom and the body of Christ. And if you are a Christian, then you are in the church. If you are a Christian, you are in the body of Christ. And if you are a Christian, you are in the kingdom. So when we see references in the Word of God to any of these three things, we can be confident that is applicable to Christians only. Jesus Christ is intimately associated with His church, with His body. He built it. He owns it. Matthew 16, 18 tells us this. Jesus rules over it. Colossians 1, 18, And He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the, from the dead, that in all things that He might have the preeminence. It reads again in Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Jesus is the Savior of the body, which means he is also the Savior of the kingdom and the church. We noted earlier in Acts 20.28 20, that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Jesus gave himself for the church. Again, Ephesians 5.25-27, to reiterate, says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, there's the called out, the people, the assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So we see that the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, came at a great personal cost to Jesus. Indeed, He gave His life as a sacrifice for it, for all Christians everywhere. So again, there's one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. So there's only one body, one kingdom, and one church of Christ. Jesus built one church. Jesus owns the one church. Jesus bled for the one church, and Jesus died for the one church. Jesus also reigns over His kingdom, which is the church, the one body of Christ. Jesus is the Savior of one church. In the gospel, there was always one church in reference to the universal worldwide body of Christians. When we open the pages of the Bible, we see that there was only one body or kingdom or church of Christ. The church of Christ was united under one hope. The Church of Christ followed one Lord. The Church of Christ practiced one unified faith. The Church of Christ administered only one baptism, and this one church was built, bought, possessed, bled for, died for, ruled, loved, and saved by Jesus Christ. In Acts 2.47, we learn that after baptism, one is added to this church by God Himself, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Since Jesus only built, bought, possessed, bled for, died for, ruled, loved, adds to and saves one church, then that better be the one that we're members of. That church must be the one we're a part of and no other. How do we make sure in this world of religious division that we see, that we live today in, that God added us to the church that He built, bought, possessed, again, bled, died for, ruled, loved, adds to and saves? The answer to that question is found in 1 Thessalonians 2.14, which reads, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. The Christians in Thessalonica patterned their faith after the churches in Judea, which were in Christ. They used the churches in Judea as a pattern, and they did what those churches did, just as we should do today. So let's apply what they did then to today. If it worked for them, why would it not work for us also? If we study the individual churches of Christ that we read of in the New Testament and we do what they did to become Christians, would we not be added to the one church by like the Lord and like they were, or by the Lord like they were? Of course we would. After we're added to the church and we worship how they worshiped 
and we obey God's will like they did, and we live faithfully like they did, and we die in Christ like they did, would we not today be what they were then? Of course we would. You see, they were faithful Christians living in the first century when the gospel was given. The Bible records the lives of Christians that we can study and learn about today. These Christians were saved and added to the church that Jesus built. He bought, possessed, bled, died for, ruled, loved, adds to, and saves. Just like the Christians in Thessalonica did with the churches in Judea. If we apply that to ourselves and do the same things, if we believe what the faithful first century Christians did in the gospel age and do what they did and are saved like they were, and if we live faithfully like they lived and worshiped how they worshiped, adding nothing to or taking away from what they did, we will be today just what they were in the first century. Christians added to the one church that Jesus built, bought, possessed, bled for, died for, ruled, loved, and adds and saves to today. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The Lord's church was built on a rock, meaning it is immovable, indestructible, unconquerable, even by death. We today can be added to that church if we simply do today what they did back then. So what must I do to be a member of the church that I read about in the Bible? What is it that I must do to be saved? It's the most important question that anyone can ask. This very question was asked by a jailer in Philippi almost 2,000 years ago as we read in Acts 16.30. Similarly, in response to the gospel message proclaimed to them that day, some among the multitude gathered on Pentecost shortly after our Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, and they asked a simple question. What shall we do in Acts 2.37? There's no subject that is more important, more relevant, or more profound to any individual than learning how to come to eternal salvation. We must always remember that salvation is only in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.10 in 2 Timothy 3.15. A person can believe in Christ, believe that he must repent of his sins and confess his faith in Christ. But you see, he's still not in Christ. Where salvation is found, one must be in Christ. The only way God's Word teaches as to how to come into Christ is through baptism. There's no other way taught in Scripture. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death, Romans 6, 3. Similarly, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, again, have put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. So baptism is pivotal, pivotal rather. Not only it is through baptism that a person comes into Christ, but it is also at baptism that a person is forgiven of his or her sins. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. On Pentecost, in response to the question, what shall we do? Peter responded, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 37 and 38. Jesus said that a person comes to salvation at baptism. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 15 through 16. While most churches that profess Christianity practice baptism in some form, most do not practice baptism as taught in the New Testament. First, many churches practice sprinkling or pouring as baptism. And the very word that is translated from the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written into English as baptize means to immerse, to bury, or to submerge. So sprinkling and pouring are innovations of man and have no support in Scripture. Second, most churches teach that a person is baptized for some reason other than to come into Christ to receive forgiveness of their sins and to come to salvation. They teach that a person should be baptized, but that it is not necessary for salvation. But the scriptures are plain, easy to understand, and repetitive in emphasizing just the opposite to that false doctrine. The only way the scriptures teach that a person comes into Christ is through baptism. The Scriptures plainly teach that forgiveness is received at baptism. The Scriptures could not be more plain in teaching that it is at baptism that a person comes to salvation. Truly, somebody has to work to misunderstand what God's Word teaches 
on the necessity of baptism for salvation. Coming to salvation is just the beginning for us. Once a person has been saved, then he begins what the Bible refers to as a new life as a Christian. It is a life lived in faithfulness to God and Christ. Jesus instructed, be faithful unto death and I will give thee, or give you rather, a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. Eternal salvation in heaven is offered to everyone, even to you. But God's not going to force you or drag you to be saved. He's demonstrated His love for you by sending His Son to pay the debt for your sins on the cross of Calvary, Romans 5.8. That love was commended, given to us. His desire to you is that you respond to His love for you, and He will love you if you obey Him. But you see, He leaves the choice up to you. Are you a member of the body of Christ today? Are you a member of the Lord's church? If you're not a member of the Lord's church, as which we've been talking about and that we've described today, what is it that's holding you back from following your plan or the plan which God has given us in the New Testament? What is it that's keeping you from being baptized and added to Christ as we read about in Romans chapter 6, 3 and 5? You see, a God again, God gives us the free will that we must choose that we want to obey Him. Again, as we read in Romans 5, 8, God committed that love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, it is Christ who died for us that He might add us to the church if we choose to follow the gospel plan of salvation. If that's something you haven't done today, I encourage you to do that before it's eternally too late. I encourage you to take that next step to find out about the one true church that we read about in the Bible, the one true church that Jesus described in Matthew 16, 18, that He would build, that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And I pray that this is your next step concerning your salvation before it's too late. Thank you for tuning in to Bible Talk today, and may God richly bless your walk with Him. Do you have questions about the Bible? Are you searching for a place to worship God like you find in the Bible? Do you have questions about your eternity? Would you like to know more about God's plan for you? Let me encourage you to visit a church of Christ near you today. If you're interested in learning more about the Lord's Church, we also offer free material. For more information or if you would like to have a transcript or copy of today's program, whether audio or video, please go to our website at www.bible-talk.org or email us at bible.talk at bible-talk.org. You can also write to us at Bible Talk, P.O. Box 40, Fayette, Alabama, 35555. Simply include the program number, and we'll be happy to send that to you free of charge. Thank you again for tuning in today, and may God bless you richly in your walk with Him.